Now, this uh, topic, you know, is, is should should we divorce? And it's a question that I know personally several. I mean, I can't even count on my hands how many people have uh, recently, um, but just over my lifespan, uh, you know, come to me with with this burdened question, you know, about whether or not they should think of divorce. And, you know, I don't think anybody who's ever been in that position gets to that point unless they've already done a lot of introspection and thinking and weighing. And so it's such, it's it, to even get to the point where you're asking a question like this is difficult, but um, it is something that is quite common. So I wanted to first, you know, just kind of talk about divorce from the Islamic perspective. Um, so we should be clear about the terms, you know, talaq uh, is of course the, the Arabic word for divorce. Um, and it literally means the undoing or freeing of a knot because of course marriage is like a bond that you uh, tie, you know, with your spouse. There's a contract, but there's a symbolism there that's quite beautiful. And so when you are, um, you know, intending to divorce, you are basically untying that bond. You are, you are uh, freeing the the couple from that marital bond. Uh, and so the in the Sharia, this uh, act uh, to in, to enact a divorce is given to the man. And we don't have enough time. You know, someone actually asked me uh, why I'm even doing this topic in this program because they don't think it's enough time. And I agree, we don't have enough time to get into the specific fiqh of these things, but. Everything that we do as Muslims is predicated on the knowledge and the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and he is just and his systems are just. So we have to really remove any um, you know, thoughts that we may have or suspicions or doubts or questions that come up within us about whether or not certain things are right or fair, because that's an accusation against our creator. So I just wanted to say that because I know this topic can get very heated, like, oh, why does why do men get to decide, you know, especially from a Western Muslim perspective, but we do not question our creator. And this is his system and his system is perfect. So he has given that right to men. However, there's also recourse for women who want to uh, remove themselves from a, a marriage as well. And this is a, 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 a different process called khala, which means, again, to pull off or to, to take off something. So these terms matter. And there's, again, symbolism there. But uh, I would advise everybody to do their own independent research um, into the specifics of these terms and the fiqh implications. I'm just introducing them again in case there are people who are just not familiar with the process of divorce. Um, and there's more to say about this, but again, in the interest of time, we're just going to move forward. Now, the Prophet has also indicated uh, to us that from all of the permissible things, right, because divorce, of course, is permissible in Islam, that uh, the divorce is the most hated in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that we should know, that it's not something we should rush to. And in this day and age where relationships are treated as though they're very they're disposable right that, that a person can just you know get into a relationship and get out because they you know the process is is easy you know in terms of even uh, the, the legal framework right you just have to file and all of a sudden you, you you're in a, in a divorce situation or annul so they they make it quite easy but this can also impact one's attitude um, about the importance and the significance of marriage in general right if you think that way that divorce is easy or that it's it's this exit ramp that's always available to you, then you may forget the weightiness of divorce. And so remembering that the Prophet said and reminded us very severely that this is permissible, but it's also quite hated. And so that's something that we should definitely internalize way before we get married and really uh, understand how um, grave of a decision it is. And of course, it is permissible for uh, for reasons, and which we'll get to. Uh, there are other verses in the Quran that also indicate where Allah subhanahu wa is advising, and m many of the verses are addressed towards men, because as I mentioned, divorce is enacted by men. So Allah is instructing men on how, uh, you know, the conditions that they should uh, abide by or the uh, rules that they should abide by when doing so. And a, a lot of them are, are also reminders of really just making sure that we show grace and compassion and mercy towards one another, right? And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really very clear. Um, and if you look at the language, it's really talking to both uh, parties, right? Do not forget graciousness between you. 
And what also reminds us that he's, he knows what we're doing. He knows our intentions because for those who have ever been through a divorce or know who people who've gone through a divorce, or maybe, you know, someone's going through a divorce right now, it's very easy to fall into a nafsi state. There's usually a lot of anger um, and animus and, and rancor and other diseases of the heart that present when a, when a couple decides to divorce. And so we can easily fall into these uh, severe states where we forget that Allah is watching and he knows exactly what we're doing. So, um, to be mindful, to do this process of divorce in the best way possible with taqwa, with, with, with that understanding that we will be held accountable before our creator. Um, uh, further reminders to say the same, fear your Lord, right? Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So divorce, again, while being permissible for uh, specific situations, there's, uh, of course, conditions to when a divorce would be permissible. It is also something that we should um, do with 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 uh, with real awareness of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every step of the way. And Allah reminds us that there are limits to the, to our behavior, to our action, and that those who transgress those limits, he he will call uh, us to to account. So may Allah protect us and forgive us and give us guidance through the process of divorce. But all of this is again just framing the uh, divorce in Islam so that we really have a proper understanding, especially again in the West when the Western attitude toward divorce sometimes prevails over the Sharia, right? And we, we need to revisit for many of us, even those who may be thinking about it, just what divorce means, not from a perspective of, of culture, but the perspective of, of your faith. Um, now, in terms of the Muslim community, I would really advise everyone to check out ISPU. They have reports. Some of them are a little older, but there are there is data available. Um, but I think ISP has probably done much all the most comprehensive reporting on different trends in the Muslim community. And so I just pulled some of these uh, forward. But it's good to at least be aware of the trends that are um, you know at play here for the Muslim community in the West and in the U.S. in particular. And so if you look here, the link um, I have at the top of the screen is the actual report. I'll just uh, show you here, uh, recommendations for promoting healthy marriages and preventing divorce in the Muslim community. So this is June 2014. It's, it's 10 years old, but it's still relevant. And I would uh, encourage anyone who's thinking about this or just wants to learn more to look at the report. But I have pulled out in the, the bolded highlighted text here are, are things that I, I think are uh, you know, everybody should know about. Just first of all, the trends, the national average in the U.S. is, is 50 percent. And uh, the Muslim uh, rate, unfortunately, has come very close to that. If I'm not, I mean, I, I was recently, I remember somewhere, and I, I believe it actually is now at 50 percent. But this is, again, 10 year data that we were looking at uh, reporting from even prior to 2014 that indicates it was somewhere between 32 and 21 percent. But I think we have, unfortunately, now we're very close to the national average. And uh, globally, the rates are also increasing. So there's data you can look at here just to familiarize yourself with the trends. Um, and then the reasons for why people are married, uh, divorcing. Now, there's uh, national reporting that is mentioned here, lack of commitment, too much arguing, infidelity marrying too young, unrealistic expectations, lack of equality, and lack of uh, premarital preparation, and of course the worst domestic violence and any type of abuse. So these are reasons why uh, people report divorcing, but specifically in the Muslim community, I think it's interesting also to look at the reasons, um, just so that for those who are in this crossroads, that you understand that a lot of this is symptomatic of, of other problems, you know, whether it's Again, diseases of the heart we mentioned, or just cultural uh, issues that I think have seeped into our communities that are overriding uh, our own faith principles, right? C cultural customs, cultural attitudes, a lot of these things can, in fact, affect our marriages. And so I think it's help it's good to let those who are in these difficult positions know that it's these problems are common. And, and when, when, when we frame it that way, we can also hopefully then talk about solutions, which we'll get to in a moment. But here are some you know, reasons for Muslim couples uh, reporting divorce, which is a lack of uh, parental involvement in children's lives, disagreements between spouses, lack of relationship knowledge, 
communication skills, marrying at a young age, and short-term engagements. There's also this other interesting paragraph that followed, which was about changing gender role dynamics, which I thought was really interesting because in my own lifetime, I have absolutely witnessed this, that the traditional roles that our religion is very clear about in terms of the household, the way that the marriage is, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is held together, the roles with, with once children come in and even the extended family members, a lot of those things are changing because we are again, going in, uh, following in, uh, you know, the, 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 or following the, um, the examples and maybe some of the uh, notions that are, uh, that, that are in the popular culture and we're abandoning, uh, in many cases, our own faith principles. So that was also something uh, that has led to divorce, right? Mismatched expectations are the most frequently reported contributors to marital conflict. And then, of course, you know, conflicts uh, with the with in-laws and family is also a very big one. I've absolutely um, been involved in mediating or trying to mediate with couples where it's the um, the uh, you know meddlesome family members that uh, are actually causing a lot of the problems with it within the marriage. So this is serious and it's very real. And so we you know again just to be familiar with these things. And there's more um, about you know low marital satisfaction. So if you're in that position where you're still married but you're just feeling like something is really off. Uh, uh, these are also the things that people have reported, uh, different interests, not spending enough time together. Again, we get in-laws or family involvement, uh, religious differences. This is a big one. And then attitude towards sex. So think about all of these things as we continue in the presentation. And hopefully we'll have enough time for Q&A um, if you have specific questions. But the report is available to everybody. And I advise, again, um, you to look at and do your own independent research. But now, um, you know, just to reiterate the, the top five reasons for divorce, I really thought it was um, interesting when you look at, you know, a visual like this, that the lack of commitment or incompatibility um, is, is the largest, right? And we call it irrecon irreconcilable differences. It's kind of like legalese, you know, for, for uh, divorce, re uh, for the reason to divorce. But uh, a lack of commitment is also, um, you know, it's, it's part of that description. So it's not just being, in you know, incompatible. It's also just not showing the commitment that's necessary. And I think that's really interesting, especially when you try to look at this from a spiritual framing, like what's going on, right? Why aren't we as committed to marriage the way that our, uh, you know, that our ancestors were, that even our grandparents, our parents, many of us, uh, our parents went through a lot in their marriages, uh, but they stayed married uh, and, and likewise with their parents. So what is it that this generation um, has an issue with, with commitment? So this is where I think a spiritual understanding would be helpful. So let's look here, Bismillah. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the Gottman Institute, I think this is also another great resource. I was going to try to create a resource list. I just didn't get a chance to do that with the slides, but I'm making the references so you can jot them down and you can always go back and watch this. But the Gottman Institute is one of the leading institutes here in the U.S. on marriage. Uh, they have a lot of research. They do trainings. Uh, a lot of therapists are actually trained in the Gottman approach. And so they um, they they have a lot of great uh, information online, but I, I've used... Uh, them in working with couples myself. And just to be clear, I forgot to put this disclaimer forward for those who may be wondering about my qualifications to talk about this topic. I am not a therapist. Um, I have no training in, in the world of therapy, but because of my work in the Muslim community uh, that predates a lot of the mental health uh, you know, um, work that we now see quite prevalent in the community, I was put in a position of, of doing a lot of work with couples, uh, you know, over 20 years ago or more, um, just because we didn't have other resources. And so people would, you know, look for, for community members who they could entrust or ask for advice. And so I just ended up working a lot with different couples and even uh, currently um, not, it's not a service I offer. It's not a service I advertise because I don't, I, there's far more qualified people, but I do have people who are close to me who are entrusted friends who sometimes um, seek my counsel on their marriage uh, issues. 
And so I'm, I'm still, you know, able to uh, offer um, whatever, you know, advice I can. And I have referred to the Gottmans as one of the resources. So this is um, a list that they've come up with uh, where they just are helping you to, to know what the signs are because they've done enough research, quite fascinating, actually, research where they, uh, you know, they they have a, a scale or, or a sort of a metric that they use when observing couples. And they say within the first three minutes, they can determine with a 96% accuracy whether or not that couple is going to divorce. And I just, I mean, this is a, over a longitudinal study, like it's a longitudinal study. So it's been, you know, over decades where they looked at um, couples that they had worked with and then checked in with them later and they had that type of accuracy. So they know what they're talking about when it comes to uh, the patterns of, of what to look out for. But they've described this uh, again, number one, a harsh startup. And that's really about like when couples are in, in meetings or with them, how the conversations begin. And when they start contentiously, when there's sarcasm, there's cynicism, there's this contempt that comes across that's always a huge red flag that this is real. This is a problem. Um, and then they have something called the four horsemen. So, you know, there's this is kind of borrowing from the biblical view of the horse, uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse. So they have this idea that if you have these patterns of communication in your exchanges and they're quite common, they will basically destroy the relationship in the order that is given. So criticism, harsh criticism, contempt, which is, you know, really like a hatred almost for the person. Defensiveness, when you're constantly on the defense, you will not take accountability um, for anything. It's always deflection and, you know, looking, scapegoating or whatever. And then stonewalling, simply shutting out, you know, the, your partner. When you start to see these behaviors, this is an indication of real real trouble flooding which is really like this emotional and it's, it's quite uh you know ex self-explanatory but the idea that when you're with your partner or talking about things that there's this f uh, flooding that happens when you know the the tensions rise where you're almost brought to silence because it's just too overwhelming so you know and each uh you know spouse i mean i've worked with men and women they have different responses there's the f flight or flight response uh women t can can be not all women are but they can be quite emotional so it can really just spiral into an emotional reaction where it's tears and and shouting and, and other things can, can come up and that's a result of the flooding experience so this is something also you want to look out for uh, body language you know when you're turning away there's no eye contact you're very um just there, there's it's an obvious evident disconnect and if you've ever been around a couple that you know there's problems it's it's obvious because of the body language you know they could be in a social setting but they're just not there's so much coldness or so much tension it can it really is uncomfortable for the people around them to be even in their company uh, but they may not be aware because for them that's normal you know when you start to disconnect it becomes a new normal so looking at that uh, failed repair attempts if you've tried to um, get you know, help or at least open conversations um, and it's just one door is closed after another um, and you just really feel defeated and like there's no hope this is also another indication but I'm going to get to, to that in a bit because I do think that sometimes we may um, we may think we're, we're really working hard uh, but we're not working smart when it comes to trying to uh, repair the damage in our relationships and I'll, and I'll speak on that in a moment but then bad memories is also another one. So when you're looking at the history of your relationship, but all you can think about or focus on are the uh, bad memories, right? The painful memories. You don't really seem to even think of any of the good. That's obviously a big red flag. So if you go to the, um, just do a simple Google search for the Gottman Institute, you'll see, you can see the specific descriptions of each of these. They, they offer a lot more, but again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on because we have more to cover, but I do want you to have resources to study or to research on your own. Now, this is just a little bit more on the four horsemen because it is something that is everybody should know. It's it's such a common reference, but I'm surprised sometimes when people have never heard of it before. Uh, but you know, I don't blame them. It's just maybe not their world. But it's a thing you should look out for as a married person. And this is why uh, it's just a little footnote. But this is why it's so essential to get premarital counseling because they will hopefully teach you to look out for these things and to 
know how to, the antidotes for them, right? How to offset them, how to make sure that these four horsemen do not enter your marriage. And so it's, it's something that everybody should be very familiar with for younger couples or couples who are kind of, you know, going through some really difficult, rough patches. Please learn more about the four horsemen and make sure that you're fluent in, in their descriptions and also their antidotes, inshallah. Now, um, you know, going to the, um, you know, the, the research where that slide where we talked about the common reason, you know, I think it was 46% of why, uh, you know, marriages, um, you know, don't work out is incompatibility and also lack of commitment. I wanted to bring this, you know, sort of spiritual lens to it because I do believe that we are in a, it's a very difficult time right now in our world uh, for many reasons. And, and I'm not just talking about the political turmoil and all of the other uh, social and cultural uh, ills of, of, of the world, but also spiritually, we've really, we're really very far from where we need to be collectively and many of us individually. May Allah guide us all. But it's very important that if you are in a position where you are questioning, whether or not to continue with your marriage, that you do not rely on yourself. And I cannot reiterate this enough because the cell, we have a blind spot, you know, the nafs, and I'm going to get to it in a moment, but the, the nafs is, is, uh, is, is so good at distorting things. And because it's within us and it's the, you know, it's, it's our perspective, it's the voice in our head. We don't dissociate it as we should when we're in these, uh, you know, difficult situations as a potential enemy. We, we give in to it. We listen to it and we let it inform us. But it's very important that if you're struggling in your marriage, that you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, foremost, and consistently asking him for guidance consistently. Ya Allah, do not leave me to myself. I don't know if I'm going to make the right decision. Please help me and send me your helpers. Send me guidance. Send me signs. But if you don't have this attitude of, I cannot figure this out. If you're overconfident in yourself, you're overconfident in your estimation of the future and, and you feel very right in your position, I'm afraid that you will make the mistake that many people have made. And I'll get to that in a moment. But this idea of the nafs and really understanding that the nafs is an enemy, right? Imam al-Ghazali, of course, one of his famous quotes, never have I dealt with anything more difficult than my own soul, which sometimes helps me and sometimes opposes me. Uh, so the, you know, and this is, you know, just the constant mujahid and nafs that we have to go through. So of course there are times where we can overcome the nafs, uh, inshallah may Allah give us that ability. But for most of us, we're not doing the spiritual work. We're not doing what we need to do to do that. So we're actually on the opposite end of it. The nafs is uh, an enemy and it will derail us and it will harm us. And so, we, we have to keep in mind. And, you know, I pulled this quote uh, uh, for, for the slide because I thought it was just so concise, but so accurate. I, I, nafs, made a lot of mistakes in my mind. This is where a lot of mistakes start. It's in the mind. The mind, uh, you know, gives us ideas and we, we double down on those ideas. We, we look for signs that's called, which I'll get to confirmation bias. It's right here. Um, but this, this way of looking at things based on my perspective, my lens, nafsi, 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 right? So just again, to, to make this point, we know shaitan is the enemy, uh, you know, outside, right? And he incites us to evil. He's the wiswas. He's the whisperer. He, this is what he does. But unequivocally, all of, you know, the, the scholars of our faith are uh, on board with this, that the nafs, the ego, is actually the greatest enemy of the human being. And so when we're in a nafsi state, which is often what happens when you feel hurt, right? When you feel like you're the victim of circumstance or of someone else, you're, you're not happy, you're feeling entitled to something that you're not getting, you fall into a very nafsi state. And what that leads to, unfortunately, is this tendency to negate, to dismiss, to completely deny Completely, which, which is, you know, ghufran and ni'mah, kufr, right? Is the denial of, of, of God's blessings. Kufr, that's what kufr is. It's to cover something that is there. And this is what we do when we uh, fall into a nafsi state. And this 
it happens in marriages where you will negate the good of your partner entirely and wholly and complete. And that's where contempt comes into the heart because all you see is their negative qualities and you start to look for those patterns. Right. And this is a cognitive distortion. It's, it's a, a trick of the mind and wh who occupies the mind, the nafs and iblis. And this is why you have to be aware of the way that your own mind works, that it, it will um, create realities that are not necessarily true. And if you don't have an objective, uh, you know, perspective to help you, whether that's a person or just th this ability to question yourself, this ability to, you know, to show empathy, to go on the other side of where your partner stands and see things from their perspective, you will continue to fall into this cognitive distortion as well as others, which again, if you're not familiar with that phrasing, you should know because we are highly susceptible uh, when we're in these situations because we're vulnerable and Iblis and our nafs being our greatest enemies will put us into states where we are so convinced of our version of reality. And then we act on that, right? We tell ourselves things, we keep repeating ideas. And then, like I said, we look for those signs. And so, uh, you know, our advisors, our parents, our uh, friends, our siblings, our teachers, we start to even uh, dismiss their advice because we are so convinced you know, so all of these people, right, all the people in our lives are telling us, wait, 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 you know, you need to be more patient, you need to do this, remember that they did good for you, don't rush into this decision, they've all lost the plot, but I, I know so well, right, this is a trick of, uh, of the nafs and shaitan, and again, I want to be clear, I'm, you know, there are situations where, where divorce is necessary and it's better. But I think because we are finding ourselves, you know, in these, in these situations where a lot of people are rushing to divorce at the, at the, you know, the, the second that things get tough, right? When the going gets tough, as they say, people start to look at that exit ramp. This is the, the context with which I'm speaking about that, that tendency to want to just run from the problem instead of, stopping thinking about things and realizing that Allah told us he's going to test us and everyone will have a test in this life or multiple tests and for some people those tests will come in their marriage so you have to think that these are spiritual realities and if you just get to the horizontal where you're fo focused solely on your your the, the material uh, aspect of the marriage right what you're getting out of it and that's kind of unfortunately how uh, the modern world frames marriage which is just basically this transactional thing where you're supposed to get something but spiritually speaking, marriage is far more than that. It's a vehicle. It's a means to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to discover yourself in a way that is impossible when you're on your own because the, the spouse is a mirror for you. So you're able to see things that you're not normally seeing when you are having those arguments and having those tense moments. So. Uh, so it's very important that, that we understand that we are susceptible to the traps of Iblis and our nafs. And part of the way that they do that is by distorting our reality. So these cognitive distortions you'll find if you are, again, affected um, in a negative way right now in your relationship, go through these and ask yourself, what do you do? Are you that person who overgeneralizes? Are you really good at labeling? Do you fortune tell, right? Are you always predicting the future and you think you're 100% right all the time, right? Mind reading. There's so much that we can learn from just understanding that these things are, we're all susceptible to them because of the nafs, the fact that we all have uh, this nafs that operates within us. Now, another um, powerful reminder um, is just to, again, uh, reiterate how Iblis and Nafs work together. The Prophet ﷺ reminds us that of all the evil actions that Iblis does, and of course, look at the world. You, you can't, I mean, it's everywhere. He, his footprint uh, is everywhere, literally. He's, 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 I mean, there's every type of evil that we can conceive and even that we can't conceive exists today. But of all these things, what Iblis loves the most is actually separating a husband and wife. And so this is where, you know, the reminder that Allah, you know, that of all the permissible things, it's the most detested. When you pair it with the fact that Iblis really does aim to destroy our marriages, because there's a ripple effect. 
theft, right? You destroy uh, a bond, then you can destroy um, the families that came together as part of that bond. If children are in that marriage, they will have a difficult time. Uh, and, and it's just this ripple effect. So Iblis knows what he's doing, but we have to remember that this is the perspective of our faith uh, around the topic of a divorce, that we try our hardest to avoid it at all costs. And it, and the best way to do that is really to go back on, you know, to, to, for, for every individual, every, um, you know, couple individually, the spouses to look at their own culpability, to look at their own accountability, to really be introspective and self and self-aware and have that type of response instead of what we tend to do, which is focus on the other. And so the, the question that I would, that I do uh, try to ask when couples are thinking about divorce and what I would challenge any couple right now or any individual who's married, who's really having some negative thoughts um, these are the questions that I, I would uh, I would advise you ask yourself. First and foremost, do you have feelings for your spouse? And don't deny it because you're prideful and you're bitter and out of spite. You want to just say no. You have to be real. If if your spouse still, if anything were to happen to your spouse, uh, could you see yourself like completely losing it? There, there's a lot of indicators of whether or not there's feelings there, but be honest with yourself. Again, these are internal conversations. You're not, you're not expected to answer to anyone, but ask yourself this question, right? And then the next question is, have you really made a sincere effort to repair the problems or have you just complained a lot? Because this is what many people do. It's we feel completely spent and exasperated because we're complaining a lot. So on our tongue, we're constantly saying, this needs to change. This needs to change. Why are you the same person? Why don't you do this? And we're, we're, you know, unraveling because we're complaining so much. But when it comes to actual actionable things, a lot of couples aren't doing the actions. They're just, it's a lot of tongue work, right? So the tongue is very busy uh, and the energy that comes with that, right? The, the loss of momentum, the loss of, of just desire. A lot of that is a, is a result of complaining, but actions are different. Actions are, I'm going to do research. I'm going to learn, right? So if you have a, a particular circumstance, um, you're married to someone who maybe has, uh, you know, a dysfunctional history, you know, whatever that is. Have you done the research? Have you worked it out to say, you know what, Allah gave me this person. He gave me uh, this, this spouse that has these challenges and I need to do my due diligence to understand this person. They came from a different background than I did. Can I try to be empathetic? You know, what effort am I putting forth so that I can, you know, stand before Allah and say, I really tried. I tried. It wasn't just complaining. I tried. So every one of us has to really ask that question of ourselves sincerely. Have we made a truly sincere effort or are we just really good at complaining? And then the, the third question is very important. Have you taken accountability for your own shortcomings? Because again, the tendency, which is a, a proof, it is a, it's, it's, it's a proof of how nafsi we are, is that we are so good at, uh, you know, at listing our, our, our spouse's problems, shortcomings, failures. Uh, we have memories that go back decades of things that they've done. And we could just really do that really well. But when it comes to our own failures and shortcomings, we don't have much to say. And that right there is a huge indicator of someone who's really deluded by nafs. Because if you're not more worried about your own accountability before Allah and trying to fix your own self, and all you're doing is waiting for your partner to be fixed, whether by you and your screaming and shouting or someone else intervening, you've got uh, some surprises coming your way that are not going to be very pleasant. So that's why before you start to drop the, the D word, as we say, you better have done your own due diligence to try to work out your culpability, your shortcomings, and make sure that you're actually clear, your conscience is clear, like you are really aware of yourself, right? And then the fourth question, have you sought counsel from qualified people? Now I have to, you know, qualify this because a lot of times we turn to the confidants in our lives, right? Our siblings, our besties, our, our uh, maybe people that we feel very uh, safe with, but are they qualified is the question. Are they qualified to answer uh, or to give you the perspective you need about uh, divorce? Are they, do they really know, you know, what, what, um, do they really have 
the um, the acumen, the background to understand the, the the patterns that need to be worked on, or the issues that may come up, or or are they just there as a comforting um, you know shoulder for you? You know that they're just there to to help you um, and listen to you, and maybe even uh, reinforce your position to you. Because you know we sometimes look for cheerleaders when we're down and out, uh, and a true confidant, a true person who's giving us nasiha and counsel, um, will will really be fair and objective. They're not going to always, you know, just stroke your ego and tell you what you want to hear. They're going to sometimes turn it back on you. So a qualified person, and again, I know that not everybody has access to therapy um, or or even maybe uh, scholars that, that are qualified to help, but you should really seek out. And now with, with on- online services, you don't have to, you're not physically limited, right? You can seek professionals that are maybe outside of your area. But I would say that is also another question. Have you done your due diligence and have you followed their uh, protocol or are you just paying for advice that you're not taking? So that's also another important follow-up to that, you know, seeking counsel, but acting on the advice of the counsel, right? And then are you using divorce as a threat or ultimatum? Uh, the D card, right? Are you dropping that because you're trying to force a uh, change? Um, or is it something that you've really thought thought through? Because in some cases, the overuse of divorce, uh, and I've seen this happen, unfortunately, where it becomes this phrase, it just loses its weight, is what actually ends up uh, causing, you know, the, 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 it's like a, this corrosiveness that just starts to spread in the relationship because, you know, saying that that word is, is, is a weapon. And so if you weaponize, uh, the, this, uh, very severe thing enough, it loses, it, it, it chips away at the trust and the bond of the relationship. And maybe the problems weren't as bad and they could have been fixed, but because, you're showing such, you know, a a lack of of, of value for the relationship by even mentioning that it actually breaks trust and then things start to just really devolve from there. So be very careful about uh, not using that as an ultimatum uh, because I've seen it unfortunately be a catalyst for an eventual divorce. And it it wasn't really what the, what the person wanted. They were just desperate. Uh, So we need to do better in terms of empowering people to uh, effect change without going down that very dark path. And then uh, if you are intentional or you have really thought about divorce, (laughs) excuse me, have you thought about your, your reason? Like, what are they? And uh, do they pass the test uh, from the Sharia perspective? Because it has to be legitimate. You know, um, in this culture, again, you don't even, I think, need to cite uh, reasons for divorce or they'll just give you that generic label of irreconcilable differences. But remember, we have to, and this is what the seventh uh, question here, uh, it leads to, we have to answer to God about our decisions. So my challenge always for couples is if today or tomorrow you had to stand before in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you stand before him, could you really defend yourself and your decision to divorce? And what would you say? Because just saying, I don't like, you know, the way that they chew their food. <laughs> Some people can get so petty, you know, is not enough. Or I didn't, I don't like their mom. Well, that's not a reason to divorce. You know, that's not a legitimate reason. There has to be far more than that. So you better be really clear that you have a legitimate grounds for divorce by the standard of Sharia, not by the standard of what you tell yourself, what your bestie tells you, or whoever else is advising you that may not be qualified to do so, because those people are actually very harmful. You know, the Shayateen, as we know, are are two, there are two categories. They're from the ins and from the uh, from the jinn. The ins are far worse than the jinn. The jinn we can't see. And you know, they they do what Iblis says, they just whisper and incite. The human shayateen are the ones who actually cause a lot of destruction. So they're not, you know, the ones that we should be worried about. Uh, what we need to be worried about is whether or not our reasons will, will have hold any weight before our creator. And that's where learning about what are legitimate grounds for the divorce and whether or not I, I am, 
you know, on, on the right path, or I'm just creating problems because I really, uh, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. I have something else that I want to pursue. Uh, I'm done. I feel like I don't want to do this anymore. Marriage isn't for me. People get really petty. And there are, again, this, these are sentiments uh, that are very popular in the culture around us. But look at look at the culture around. And that's what I would always challenge someone. Look at the people that espouse these ideas that you don't really need to be married. And if marriage isn't convenient for you, just get out. You know, all the billah, all the billah from this flippant attitude that uh, takes something so sacred and so beautiful and so weighty in the sight of God and turns it into something meaningless. So, you know, we, we have to be very careful to not give in to that. And that's, again, another indication of mess if you're thinking uh, that your petty reasons for divorce are just enough or because, you know, you have a divorce lawyer who's telling you to do it, that, that you have enough reason to do it. Uh, it doesn't work that way. And these are just, you know, reminders. Again, Imam al-Ghazali reminds us to get what you love, you must first be patient with what you hate. And this is the ultimate test of, of the believer, you know, that we're going to go through those uh, natural ups and downs of life and uh, things aren't going to always be uh, perfect. But if you want, you know, to really succeed, you have to be willing to go through those challenges because life will test you. But Allah's promise is true. We know this. So you have to be in it for the long game. And uh, just again, falling into this nasty state of, ah, I'm done. Um, it's just, it's so postmodern. It's so dangerous and it's very demonic. So that's why we have to push back on that. Now, something that many of you may not be familiar with is something called divorce regret. And I really think this is important as well because it's not talked about as much. You know, if you did a search for divorce, there's a lot of, again, championing of this, uh, you know, as, as an option, as what, why not? Because, you know, Western attitudes are just so blasé. But there is also another side of divorce that is very researched and very real that we need to hear more about. And so here, I mean, just look at this. I, th I th thought this was just, you know, shocking. Statistical data suggests that at least one third of people regret their marriage dissolution. Okay, so one third, 33%. It can actually go up to 80%. Okay, subhanAllah. Why isn't this talked about? That more than, I mean, that's a significant number of people who are divorced. And again, we're not talking about people who have been in really horrible situations like, um, you know, partner violence, affairs, addictions. We're talking about just irreconcilable differences, a lack of commitment, whatever the generic reasons are that people want to just get out. You know, they don't, they're not happy anymore. I'm not in love with my partner anymore. What does that mean? Were you ever in love or were you in love with an ideal? Were you in love with some image that you created? Because, you know, I mean, there's all those questions that we can ask ourselves, but 80% of people, I mean, this is significant and we need to really think about our decisions to divorce when we see the, when we see these numbers, right? So here are the reasons why people d regret divorce. Again, think about all of this, because if you're really being a responsible person, first of all, as we mentioned, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we're thinking about anything, right? I mean, the Sahaba, as we know, for every life decision, they were making a stikhara, like for the most mundane things that we would think mundane, but because they had so much need for, the, for trusting Allah and they really turned to Allah for guidance. So... Uh, you know, they, what did they do? They, they would make istikhara constantly. And here we are just again flipping. But reasons for divorce. Sometimes the emotional upheaval of the divorce far exceeds what people expect. And again, having witnessed people, um, you know, having witnessed people uh, go through divorce, I will say this is very, very real. That people don't realize how taxing the divorce process is. They think of it as this plug that I'm going to pull and it's going to be over and it's going to be easy, but it actually ends up being really, really difficult to go through the divorce itself. So that becomes a reason for regret. The effects of divorce on children, right? A lot of people who go through divorce end up having, in hindsight, they realize like, oh, you know, they started to see uh, things with their children that they wished they could take back. Um, but, you know, we if you're doing things responsibly and, uh, you know, with 
taqwa, then you shouldn't regret those decisions. The, the, and the believer has to be firm. When you do things according to Sharia, with guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing all those checks, you're making your istikhara, you're seeking counsel from the right people. Then when you, you know, go through a challenge, even if your children are affected by that, you have to know outcomes are, you know, in the hands of Allah, you did everything right. And maybe that's their test in their life, but the power of dua, the power of guidance will affect them as well. Inshallah, they can come out of it. And a lot of children of divorce, of course, are, are normal and they're fine. And they're not all, they, they've, they've, you know, I, I, I know several, they're fine. So it, it's not, uh, you know, doom and gloom, but it's more that those who have had regrets look back and have noticed certain things with their children that they wished they didn't go through. But I just want to be fair here because painting uh, it as all uh, always negative and always bad for even those who've done their due diligence to do this responsibly is not fair because divorce is permissible for a reason. And there are many people who have divorced and alhamdulillah, they've moved on and Allah has opened doors for them. So that is also something that we have to keep in mind. But this is specifically for people who who have regretted their, their decision. Uh, financial consequences. So just, again, think about that, that divorce is very costly. I have lawyers in my family and people that I know uh, closely who are always talking about just how costly divorce is. So it is it is very, very difficult financially to manage. Um, it, it, people get through it, of course, but be prepared for that and do your homework and know that there are ramifications. Uh, whether or not you uh, go through the courts or not, it just gets costly and adds up. Um, additional failed relationships. So, you know, moving on from, from that, uh, marriage can be painful. Trust is lost for a lot of people after, marriage, uh, after divorce. Uh, again, it's possible and life... Uh, after divorce is absolutely possible. So I'm not uh, trying to negate that reality. I'm just, again, talking about people who create a, a fantasy about, you know, getting out of a marriage, thinking that everything is going to be perfect. You, uh, you actually have to see all the perspectives, all the things that could potentially happen and just be realistic. So the reality is that there are people who do have failed relationships. They also suffer loneliness. Um, and then there are people who just regretted it because they face so much stigma. And this is a whole other conversation that I have had multiple times and I uh, really think is also important about the horrible pattern of stigmatizing divorced people, men and women, which is unacceptable. It's not part of our faith. Um, divorce is just a reality of life that some people have to go through. So the idea of punishing people for going through a divorce is uh, heinous and it should never uh, occur. And so we have to be clear that uh, you know, that for those people who have regretted it, um, they suffered injustice because if they, again, went through that life, uh, you know, challenge and it's, a, it is, it's a tribulation for a lot of people. For some people, it's a, it's a liberation. Um, so uh, depending on the situation, but whatever the case is, if they have dealt with stigma or any type of abuse or judgment from their community or family, um, inshallah, they will be rewarded. Uh, but that's certainly not fair in any way. And we have to be more responsible as community members to understand, not to pry, not to make assumptions, not to uh, judge people and to just leave people be right? Because it's none of our business. And this is also uh, our, our deen, right? Uh, to uh, to mind our own business. Uh, part of the beauty of one's Islam is to leave that which does not concern them. So that's a whole other topic, but it's a very important topic as well. And then how the decision was made. And this is really the crux of it, how the decision is made, because a lot of people will reevaluate the process of the divorce and realize that there was, uh, you know, this impetuousness, this rush, this push that that they felt compelled to do at that time. That in hindsight, they realized that you know what, there was something else. You know, I I, I felt like there was this urgency to get out. But then now that I look back on it, I realized I could have done things differently. I could have, I should have, I shouldn't have. So all of those questions about uh, individual responsibility start to creep up for a lot of people after the divorce is settled, right? And this is also another indication that the nafs, which, you know, uh, is, is, as we mentioned, our greatest enemy, working with its co-conspirator, Iblis, will push us into uh, decisions without much thought. Ajila min shaitan right? At the min Allah, ajila min shaitan the Prophet said. Consideration 
is from Allah and rushing, uh, haphazardly making decisions. Um, and this is where, you know, men, for example, who just become in an angered state and then drop the divorce three times all at once, you're not thinking. And Allah gave you the right of divorce because you're supposed to be rational about this. You're supposed to be able to regulate your emotions. But when you give in to uh, those, those, you know, uh, whisperings and, and your own, Nafs, you um, you weaponize against something that was given to you to maintain the bond and to to really weigh things properly. Uh, but this is an occurrence constantly, all the time. I mean, I've I've worked with so many unfortunately situations where it was the men who, you know, um, who did that, who just uh, dropped it, and boom, you know, it's over, and it becomes very very difficult from that perspective. But the de- the way the decision to divorce, whether it's from the man or the woman. Um, how it comes about is very important. And this is why individual responsibility is important, that every single spouse has to really think about and weigh their decision carefully between them and God. This is the most important conversation. You and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because if your conscience is clear with Allah, you've done your due diligence, you've tried, you've gone over and above, 102%, 200% to try to make the marriage work. You've sought counsel, you've sought help, uh, you've done your istikhara. You're not out there on a war path trying to destroy, you know, your spouse, but you're just really thinking this is just not a, a situation that's healthy anymore for legitimate reasons. And you decide to make that decision. That's a different, you know, you'll be, you'll, you, you will, you'll just be in a different circumstance as opposed to the opposite, which I think a lot of times happens where people again rush into that because they feel compelled to uh, escape a situation that they no longer want. And they think that um, by getting out that they're, you know, things will get better, but they actually end up unfortunately suffering uh, in other ways with regret. So this is real and, and it's important. Again, 80% is a pretty significant number. Now, to end kind of on a high note, I, I don't want to leave everybody feeling heavy, but it is important to to focus on how to overcome difficulties in marriage because marriage is difficult. Uh, and anybody who tells you otherwise is not telling you the truth. And that's why it's very important to, um, to get that premarital counseling, because if you're not getting enough premarital counseling, you will forget, right? You will, you will, um, you will not think about how to protect your relationship from all the things that we talked about, like the four horsemen and all those other things. But also you won't know what to look for um, as signs that you're, you're overcoming the difficulties of your marriage or, or of your relationship. So the patterns that you want to look at are, you know, friends, friendship, right? Just to establish a sort of rapport uh, with your spouse. And so look for ways to do that. Obviously, you know, spending time with each other is going to be important uh, to do that. And, and, and this is where if you feel like you're drifting apart, um, it would be very beneficial to, you know, seek out professional help. How can I bring back some of that, you know, into the relationship? How can I, um, you know, work on creating more cohesion with my partner? What do I need to do? But, you know, sometimes when Need guidance on that. So just trying to promote more friendship. Um, and also remembering that you, you will go through difficult things, right? As we mentioned, marriage is difficult, but inshallah, for couples who uh, overcome that, they can kind of see the long term, uh, you know, path ahead and they don't, they're not quick to want to run, run or get out uh, that, that, that it will be a kind of part of the, the story, right? That you have gone through challenges. Also, you know, the, um, to, to let each other be is very important because sometimes we have this idea that we have to kind of lose ourselves once we become part of a unit and we just become this like, you know, unified, you know, uh, melding of, of two individuals or, whereas actually it's, it's not the case at all. Healthy marriages are of two individuals that are coming together for the sake of, you know, other shared interests, but they still maintain their individuality. And so not wanting to change or force changes on your partner is really important, you know, to make sure that you are, um, you're healthy in your attitude, that you don't look at your partner as an extension of you, because that's also very narcissistic and very self-involved, but that they're their own individuals. They'll stand before God. They have their own path way before you and that you honor their differences and that even when you have certain differences that you're, you try to work with them, right? 
And then um, difficult conversations, um, overcoming discord, right? Uh, making light of each other's quirks, so being uh, having banter, teasing. These are all healthy patterns that you should hope to inculcate in your relationship. And boundaries with families. This is another really important one, especially when we talk about how in-laws and interference from family can really affect the marital bond, making sure that there are clear boundaries at the onset um, of what is acceptable and what we share and what we don't share and who we invite into the marriage and who we don't invite. All of that has to be worked out. But these are you know, just uh, signs and indicators of, uh, of couples that are on a good trajectory. So inshallah, we should aim for, for these things. And then um, that's, that's the final slide. Uh, now, I just want to be clear. The topic for today was about people who are really contemplating divorce but this was not to address the obvious reasons for divorce. If someone is in an abusive relationship, I think it's pretty clear, and even in by by our faith and by anybody's standard, that that person has grounds for divorce, and that they're not in this you know sort of limbo state of what should I do? Maybe you might need guidance on how to get out, but the question of should I divorce is not something that a person who's a victim of abuse uh, needs to ask. You do need to get out because nobody should be subjected to, to abuse. So I just want to be very clear that this topic was not to address those situations because those are clear. This was for the people who are dealing with the day-to-day -day difficulties and challenges that present in a marriage that may not be um, that, that are nowhere on the on the severity of an of abuse or, or any type of you know real legitimate reason to divorce, but more personal you know differences, uh, petty sort of uh, ego issues, challenges, communication problems, just personality clashes. Uh, we're not always going to see eye to eye with our partners, but that is not a reason to want to bail on a marriage. Uh, and so that's what this topic was for. And I, I just really want to be clear about that, especially as we go into the Q&A, because anybody who's here who's coming from a background of abuse, I hope you don't need anybody to tell you this. But if you do, you know, if you're being abused in any way, especially uh, any type of physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, any type of abuse where it's really affecting you, your faith, your your sense of safety and security, you don't need permission to seek an exit out of that relationship. You already have it. So please just figure that out in terms of how. Uh, but I, I just uh, I did I, I wanted to just be clear about that because I I don't want people to walk away thinking that oh this wasn't addressed and that wasn't addressed. This was a very specific topic for people who are at a crossroads about their relationship. They're not sure what to do, and they may, and they certainly are, because that's the challenge that we have as couples. They are victims of uh, the uh, attack of, of Iblis and Nefs and trying to destroy the home. And so for those people, this talk was uh, just a general talk. But inshallah, we can stop here. I know I must have gone over, but I'm happy to stay on uh, for any Q&A. Beautiful, as always. I want to just share two specific comments for individuals who really benefited so alhamdulillah your lecture gives extremely useful advice techniques to use as a compass to deeply reflect and delve into the mindful assessments of the question of divorce and then also um invaluable insightful and thought-provoking may allah continue to bless you and your family with success always and i kind of want to take a moment to like reinforce what you ended with Ustada Hosai, that this topic is very specific and what you began with essentially at this topic was that an hour on a Friday is definitely not enough to dive into all of the nuances around divorce and the why and so forth but the questions that you pose that people can consider when they are at the crossroads is very critical and the steps beyond that is something where working with community and scholars and so forth to see what is the best avenue and path for you Right. Whether you're man, where whether you're a man or a woman in a relationship, right? It's the question whether it's the right step for you. And then you also mentioned about abuse. Um, I think you covered this, I believe, but the verbal, whether it's verbal abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, abuse is abuse. And you mentioned this consistently throughout um a couple of your topics. There's 
forms of abuse that are causing harm, if it's causing a harm to your sense of safety overall, then it's it's appropriate to seek help. Absolutely. And that's why I felt like uh, I needed to, uh, I should have maybe done it at the beginning of the talk just to set the tone. But I think uh, for me anyway, it was clear that there are, are very legitimate grounds for divorce and abuse is absolutely one of them. So this conversation was really more for people who are just at that crossroads. They're just not sure because they are being affected by their own, maybe expectations aren't being met and, you know, they're disappointed in certain things that are not going their way. So that's, you know, just natural enough wanting to get out of a situation. Uh, and for those people, um, we want to be doing what we should be doing, which is advising responsibly that they really weigh their decisions carefully because the ramifications uh, can can be severe in this world and the next. Okay, so that we have two anonymous questions that came in. This, this question could be a topic of its own as well, um, but if you could provide resources or guidance on... Um, so I'll place the question first. There are so many of us who are illiterate in the rights of marriage in Islam, and I'm wondering if the Ustada can shed some light on the rights of wives and husbands in Islam. In this day and age, many struggle with men who are self-absorbed and can be mean even to the children, or um, it would be nice to know when our rights are violated and if we are inadvertently violating theirs as well, and when divorce would be reasonable. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that is, it's a very important question, but there's entire courses that go over the rights of, you know, marriage uh, for the husband and wife and very specific details about what is expected of each. So it would, we, we don't have enough time to go through that, but I definitely, there are things that are recorded. There's many classes and lectures. There's texts that you can uh, read. Um, I don't have like a list of sources online. I mean, available right now off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can, uh, we can, you know, uh, maybe create something and then um, send that out or post it on the link to this talk. Once I get a chance, uh, maybe we can also ask some of the other teachers who I think may have even classes on these topics, right. That they may have done the fiqh of, of marriage, for example. Uh, so I, I think though it's, Part of our job in our community is to provide those resources, yes, but also to incentivize young couples way before, or even singles before they're married, to go in and take these classes um, and to really be well versed in the rights of marriage and to know. Uh, what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, and what is accept, uh, expected of you, right, first. Because we're good at sometimes about knowing what we're owed, but we don't really do enough work on knowing what we are going to have to deliver. So um, taking the time to learn all of that. But let's see if I can maybe create some resource list afterwards offline, inshallah. Sada Hosa, along that same note, I feel a, a couple of individuals asked for your slides. If we could kind of take those or the links where you've gotten the resources from, right? And then we can kind of collate that and share that as well. That would be very helpful to some of the audience, I believe. Sure. Yeah, no, I can, uh, the ISPU, I can provide actually here. I'll, I'll give you the links to some of these uh, right here uh, in the chat. If you can share them with the, um, with the uh, live chat. I'll put them in the chat. And I also believe there's another message in there in the private chat from CD from someone. So if you could talk. Oh, okay, me. sure. Let yeah. me listen, um, while that is happening, another question essentially is I want to take this question a little bit a step further. How do you deal with a person who always is always right and never wrong in any case, give silent treatment, and when you try to reconcile by taking talking first, all the blame is on you and they take no accountability? pause in scenarios where you want to help resurrect the marriage or improve the marriage right and the other party is not open to it what do you do in those scenarios and how do you how do you approach a scenario where you do want to pick something because you talked about a lot there's a lot to consider right but right. if it's only really considered by one party it's not going to work right so how do you make it so both parties are considering this Right. Um, it's, it's difficult. I've absolutely uh, run into uh, 
situations where one spouse is very eager on getting help and seeking help and then they're being stonewalled and being completely sidelined and you know the doors being closed on them and even threatened i've had people tell me that their spouses threatened them to divorce if they actually try to seek help so that's complete abuse and uh, it's unacceptable and i think you know, there's a way, a few ways around this, but before people get married, there should be just as we create, I mean, this is my advice, but I think we're seeing so many cases now of this type of behavior that we almost have to preempt it in the NICAD process, you know, so before you draw out your NICAD, there should be, I think, some, uh, some, you know, addition there that would allow for protocol like what what are we going to do in the event of problems in our in our marriage and what does the process look like what is a healthy process does it involve family does it involve a specific teacher is there a resource that we both agree on that we are allowed to in you know invite into the marriage to, in order to facilitate but all of that i think has to be predetermined for the younger couples now if you're already in a marriage and you're dealing with this type of behavior depending on you know who you are if you're the the female i would say absolutely this is when you, if you feel like your spouse is being unreasonable and they're not willing to get any help and you are you know seeing your marriage basically fall apart uh, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of safeguarding the marriage especially if they refuse uh, to to work on themselves or if they're putting all the, you know, expectation on you and they are completely just re refusing. This is when you have the right to, um, to in, in invite your wali, the person that you um, see as an authority o over you that is supposed to manage these types of things. That could be your father. It could be your uncle. It could be, um, you know, someone in, in your community for the converts. Sometimes they ask the imams uh, of their community or a sheikh to be serve as their wali. You are in your right absolutely to enlist the help of a person of authority to basically speak to your husband and to get, um, you know, to get him straightened out because it's not right to just keep telling women in these situations like, oh, be patient, be patient, be patient for how long, you know, when you're dealing with a, a husband who is refusing help, but the toxic behavior, the abusive behavior, the negligent behavior continues this is uh, outrageous uh, to keep expecting the wife to just hold her tongue and take it. This is not right. Um, she has to be empowered. So I think uh, allowing or identifying who that is, is very important. Having that person clear for you, like I'm going to invite uh, my, who, and it could, if you want to keep your parents out of it, maybe you have an older sibling um, who, who could uh, play that role, especially if they're, you know, upright um, God fearing people who know the, the Sharia well, who can easily uh, put your uh, husband in, in his place Uh you know, in that way that men know how to do, you know, men speak with men in a way that women don't speak to men. So maybe that's what you need to do. Um, but I, I would say absolutely uh, don't feel like you just have to take it because that uh, has led to so much pain and it has horrible effects, especially when children are in the home of just daily um, tension and uh, cycles of abuse that, that just kind of grow from there. So we need to interrupt those cycles and empower those who are victims to, to know how to get out of them. Um, there's two questions that are kind of similarly related. You started your presentation off in terms of like um, talaq and then tula, right? So um, could you go a little bit more into the nuances between men asking and requesting for divorce versus when is it permissible for a woman to request divorce? So a little bit, if you could, because there's some conversations about in the chat about like, why can't a woman initiate divorce? Yeah. And this is what I was saying in the beginning, like, you know, the fiqh of these things is specific, but essentially men are given the uh, ability to enact the divorce because generally speaking, um, men are, you know, able to, or they're supposed to anyway, have the ability to really not get into an emotional state about that decision. It's a very weighty decision um, and they, there's a lot at stake. And so for a man who has the, um, you know, who's able to kind of be 
present in, in that rational state, he will not fall into an emotional state, at least that's what we hope, and uh, just throw out the word divorce carelessly because it's such a severe thing to do. Whereas women, as we know, and if we're being honest with ourselves, we do tend to fall into highly emotional states. Um, I know many uh, sisters who um, b- uh, just because they're so fed up, they they will use you know these uh, references um, as a means of just, they're so exasperated, they're done, they're just feeling like they're at their last, uh, you know, uh, straw and they don't, they don't have any more to give. So they'll just be like, I want out. And so they kind of can fall into, I think these very heightened emotional states. And for that reason, um, the woman is not given the authority to divorce with the words, like with the actual pronouncement of talaq. However, if she wants to divorce, she has the recourse of fala, which is basically making, ensuring that she is really also consciously making this decision. It's not a reactive state. It's a state of weighing everything. And she goes through the proper channels, the authority, which would likely be in her community, um, the masjid or the sheikh, someone that she can ask uh, to release her from that marriage, who's you know looking at the case the way that a responsible party should. But the right of divorce um, to, to enact it in the in the moment is given to the man for that reason. Um, and uh, but again, it's a it's a very weighty decision. So it's not something that we should look at as, oh, it's privileged and we don't have it. It's a huge amana and a huge responsibility. And uh, and there's so much writing on it that in a way I feel anyway, as a woman, that it's a protection for us. Alhamdulillah, because. I think we would have a lot more divorces if uh, if women were able to enact it because we're we're communicative, we're verbal, we're reactive verbally. So anyway, there's wisdom in everything. Alhamdulillah. There's so many different questions coming in, and all of them have nuanced portions and need so much time. But I want to take some time for those who got up the courage to send some of these questions in anonymously, which means that it's been really weighing heavily on their hearts. Um, so one of the questions is question on abandonment and abandonment and separation. I have seen the guidance on what to do if the husband separates and leaves. I have been praying for guidance and patience. It has been more than three months and I find myself the only one trying to reconcile due to the severity of such a decision and the impact on our child and the future. There are mental health issues and substances um, used behind the abandonment. How will I know divorce is the right decision? Yeah, this is where I think trying to make such a huge decision that impacts so many lives, your own, your child, everything else on your own um, is where you're going to feel really overwhelmed. But having objective, qualified experts that you can lay it all out to and asking them for their assessment, for their uh, opinion and their you know advice, I think will help to solidify your own resolve. And of course, continuous istikhara. We have to continuously ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, not to give up. It's not a one-time thing. Sometimes people think, oh, I, just, I made istikhara, but no, no. As long as you're in the thick of these things and you're really, uh, again, just not sure what to do, continuously turning to Allah every single day, please guide me, please help me. And then seeking out the professionals, the experts who you can entrust with your circumstance and say, what do you advise? And maybe you'll find that they either uh, have a whole other recourse that you never thought of or an option that you never even entertained. So that's the wisdom of um, you know, seeking counsel. So I would definitely say to not try to make a decision this way on your own. I know we are closing it on time, but two more interconnected questions, also private. Um, question on divorce. Is it okay, truly okay to divorce when there is no intimacy for years or and or months? And mm. on the flip side, for the pers- for person experiencing impotency, impotency and they cannot fulfill their partner's needs, do they need to divorce their partner? Yeah, this is a, a very difficult situation. Again, I'm not, I just want to be clear. Uh, you know, these are sometimes uh, very um, nuanced situations that require, you know, like a fatwa or, or a sheikh to really, sheikh, sheikh, to be able to properly give, um, uh, you know, some, some, you know, answer, but just generally speaking, intimacy is a right. It's a marital right. And if, if that's one of the reasons why many people marry because they need protection from the fitna of, of, you know, not being married. And especially in this overly sexualized world that we live in, it can be very difficult to try to even have any semblance of, of uh, celibacy or, or just, you know, 
being protected without an outlet. So I think um, we need uh, we need to make sure that um, our marriages are that that's a healthy part of our marriage. Now, for if there's a medical issue or there's some reason why a partner cannot fulfill that right, then I think that's where the couple really needs to have a very serious conversation with each other. And each person has to determine whether or not it is something that, you know, they can live without if the love or the bond or the children or whatever else is holding the relationship together in spite of that, is it enough? Or if it's really a pressing desire and need that the, the person has, which they have the right to um to exercise that they just can't live without and that's a very subjective and deep personal conversation i think that couple has to have and they can certainly have it with a mediator or a professional to really again weigh all their options so that they're not rushing into a decision but to just shut it down or to expect one partner to be like just okay with it and to make that sacrifice and then to shame them as though they're being you know uh, overly um you know that their their desires are so great and they're being this or that or the other is not right because uh, the sexual part of the relationship is a is a significant part of of, of marriage uh, for for most I would say most couples, uh, and so um, again they, they'd have to really talk it through. And I would definitely say um, consider having a mediator or a professional part of that conversation as well, so that they can present to you alternatives and options. Inshallah. Zakhlaq Khairan, and then one more question. Um... These are, there's so many that flooded in through the chat, but I want to be mindful of the topic as well, right? So the topic was, should we consider divorce? Because going beyond that, in terms of if people are experiencing specific things that definitely needs professional assistance, right? Um, but this is one such scenario. What if the man is abusive behind closed doors and runs an Islamic organization as a figure of the public? How does a woman safely divorce him and what scholars can be involved? Right. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we know that there are cases of spiritual abuse that happen in the community and uh, nobody is above these things. Uh, I think that's a real um, something we have to be clear about uh, that we shouldn't believe for a moment that there are people that are above the ability to fall short and to, to make mistakes even in their marriages, whether they are scholars or doctors or lawyers or whatever professional background or other background that they have. Everybody, we're all human beings. But I think, you know, um, I would definitely uh, advise the couple to seek out, uh, you know, legitimate scholars that are, you know, known in the community um, for advice and for guidance and to proceed, you know, uh, according to Sharia, because, um, you know, if you that's there's just no other way well, how else can you uh, proceed right i mean uh, when you have again those types of situations are very delicate there's a lot of things that uh, you want to be mindful of but entrusting uh, an objective third party someone who is known in the community who's an leader who's an elder to be able to advise and to uh, facilitate and to maybe even process or be part of the process of divorce i think that that's the best way forward for that for that person Inshallah. This must be tough for you because there's it's just so nuanced, all of it, and we can't give a blanket solution to everyone. It's all meant to be for each scenario, for each person and self-reflection involved. So I uh, we appreciate the time that you're taking for all of this. Just like more Um yeah. And audience, we recognize, celebrate mercy, tuning, those tuning in, we recognize that this time is never enough to address all of the concerns that you have individually. So we are taking into account that this topic is important and we're seeing your engagement. We're seeing how this is affecting you. And inshallah, we can work to bring you more lessons and um, teachings that revolve around topics like this that are affecting you personally. And inshallah, connecting you to the right resources so that you are able to navigate your hardships and find ease soon, inshallah. Um, one final question while we're here. I know we're like way over time, Ustada. So please, 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 please bear with me. And thank you so much. Um, essentially, I wanted to ask one more question, which is, um, do you have any references for any Muslim-run legal organizations that can support women seeking low-cost or sliding-scale U.S. legal divorces? Mashallah. Um, there, here in the Bay Area, we have uh, Sister Sana uh, Subhani, who leads the Wasila Connections. 
I don't know if there are sister organizations, you know, much there's just so many things that are always, our community is growing and there's a lot of services that are being added, but um, I think she would be a good starting point. Uh, she, the entire organization that she's created is to actually provide services to divorced uh, couples and children out of divorced families. And it's just a wonderful initiative that she started. May Allah bless her. But I know that they have like um, legal advice. They have, you know, mental health services. They have created, a, a, you know, a, an entire organization on all of these things. Now, she may be a good person to ask for resources in your respective area. So I would um, contact her. Uh, I can, let me, if I can find the page, I'll, I'll post it here. But it's Wasila Connections. Um, let me see if I can get you the website. Uh, and I believe this is important for everyone. Um, sharing of resources is important. If you're tuning into this um, video, post after it's posted. If you have resources and links, definitely share them, but also with a grain of salt, right? None of us are experts in this area. Allah places different hardships in different people's lives and we navigate them to the best of our abilities. And um, if there are not resources in your local community, then reach out through us, through other other um, other organizations, through your friends to find resources outside of your local community if needed, right? It's never meant to be where you sit and suffer alone. That is not what the Ummah is about. The Ummah is about, isn't about suffering alone. So definitely, inshallah, may someone come along your way so that they can help ease your path forward. If, again, you are considering divorce and even beyond. I mean, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just going over the questions. I want to make sure I, we didn't miss any that were really important because I know there's so much stigma and there's a lot of people who are afraid to ask certain questions. So I, I'm sure your team did a thorough review of all the questions coming in. But uh, for my sake, don't worry about timing. If there's any question that's pressing okay. and someone really needs help, you, you know, I can, we're, we're at, maybe we can go another, yeah. you know, five five minutes or 10 minutes. Okay. There might yeah. be a few more then. Give me a quick second. Yeah, I just don't want to leave anybody um, feeling um, um, you know. Question on the marriage contract then. Let's talk about those who are approaching marriage because now this is something that you do worry about, right? What if you don't get along with your spouse or what if something happens after, right? So Ustada, I have heard in the marriage contract, it's not often spoke about given women's emotional tendencies, but I've heard she can stipulate in her contract the right to free herself from the marriage at any time. Is this something helpful in narcissistic abusive relationships? So I think, again, when you're drafting your NICA contract, you should do it um, with an expert, with someone who's well-versed in Islamic law so that you're doing it properly exercising your rights. And it just doesn't become this long list of demands that you want and these, you know, stipulations that you're putting in because it's off putting if you get a contract that has all these kind of ambiguous, you know, terms, I don't think people would feel safe, you know, if it's left like open ended like that. So I would say the phrasing really matters, very specific language on what do you mean by free yourself? What is the condition? You know, those things have to be clear because a person entering that bond, I think, would want to know what they're getting into. But if you just for whatever reason feel like, yeah, I'm out, you know, I'm tapping out and I put it in my contract uh, that I can do that. I don't know if that's legally, first of all, sound or permissible. There are certain things, for example, um, marrying more than one. That is a very well established uh, part of the marriage contract that a woman has the right to say if the husband chooses to marry another we cannot prevent that because by sharia they're permitted to marry more than one but what we can stipulate in the contract is that it is legal grounds for divorce that the woman has the right to exit that marriage so something like that which has already been vetted already been determined as sound is permissible but kind of keeping it open and ambiguous or vague is where I think is dangerous and we don't want to act from whim and desire. We want to act from taqwa and that's where getting a, a scholarly person or someone who knows the fiqh to look over one's you know requests and conditions would be wise. Um, one more. If your husband is not fulfilling his role as the imam of the house, is this sufficient reason for divorce? He pays the bills but does not nurture the kids or me as his wife. He uses his authority when it suits him without consistency. Um, please let me know what I should do. 
Yeah, this is a case where I think, you know, it's it sounds like we need more context. Um, you know, people are on different trajectories uh, in their faith. And if a person is uh, still Muslim and they're still, you know, practicing, I mean, they have faith, but maybe they're not fulfilling all of their duties, uh, their, their derelict in some of their uh, spiritual uh, responsibilities. Um, this is where, you know, I mean, they say in this culture, like you're, you're married through thick and thin, right? Through hardships and through challenges. So spiritual challenges are real. And sometimes people just kind of, you know, go, fall into this dip. So I think having a little bit of empathy may go a long way instead of just um, looking down on your partner, you know, like, oh, they're just, they're, they're, they've gone astray. Um, so, you know, what I mean by empathy is realizing maybe they're going through something that's causing them to not fulfill their religious obligations. And as a spouse, it would be good to at least in good faith, try to address it. You know, maybe you can seek out if the local imam or someone in the family who's trusted, like a brother or sibling could talk to them, could advise, but if they're really uh, adamant or, you know, just going through something and then that's bleeding into the relationship and it's causing other problems, then I think you need to explore your options, but always again, you know, be a person who's trying to uh, be empathic as the first line of, of, of action. If it's like, oh, they're not doing what I like, or they're not exactly what I expected, I'm, I'm out the door. That I think is the attitude that I'm trying to address this, this desire to just kind of pull the plug on a marriage so quickly because it's convenient and you can. It's alien to our tradition. It's not from our faith. It's from this culture that has normalized just, you know, recycling and getting through relationships really quickly. This is not our faith. Our faith is a faith that really sees marriage as a grounds for tests and it grounds for spiritual growth and development. And sometimes it is your partner that when you're drowning, they pull, they're the life, you know, uh, they give you the lifeline that helps you out of it. So not to bail on someone just because they're going through some spiritual challenges, but rather try your best to advise, to give nasiha, to pray a lot for their guidance, to seek those advisors um, that could maybe help. And if you feel like it's just getting to the point where it's not tenable and it's becoming really difficult to stay married to that person, of course, then now you have options, but always do things with that degree of ihsan, of taqwa, of, of real desire to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before uh, your own nafs, and inshallah Allah will give you tawfiq. I want to take a moment to kind of combine a couple of these questions that are, I think, within the with the same premise. What if you got married and then you find out that it was for a false reason? Right. So say for a green card, say for your money, say for some the access to something that through you, right? It's not for you, to you, but for the things that you have access to. Um, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, if if there's fraud, you know, that led to a marriage, that is grounds for divorce. But you also want to, once everything is out in the open and clear, this is where, again, seeking the counsel of your family, you know, the, the your spouse's family, the, the teachers in your community would be wise because even if those, you know, the, the, there were, there was fraud, maybe there was some reason for that. And I'm not legitimizing fraud, but I think we have to empower people to make decisions that are, that they're investing in their own future as well. And not just, um, you know, kind of quickly, again, um, knee-jerk knee reactions to things. People are complicated. People are, uh, you know, they make uh, poor decisions based on fear or maybe there was some other, you know, context to why they felt the need to, you know, hide something or distort something. Whatever the case is, you should just make informed decisions and put all of it out and decide and put your trust in Allah because sometimes good can come from even those really complicated situations. Um, People have, have overcome a lot of challenges uh, just because they had the right niya and they trusted Allah and they did their due diligence. So I just feel like we, we, we need to really just turn to God with these types of complex situations instead of giving people these snap answers and then, you know, 
just causing havoc that they didn't foresee because you're just giving into an emotional reaction as opposed to saying, slow down. Okay, so they did this. Do you know the reason why they did this? Have you investigated? Can you maybe take this negative situation and make something positive come out of it in terms of, you know, um, the future? Like, can you do all that? If it's not possible, it's not possible, but at least you did your due diligence to make an informed decision and, uh, and you did it with the proper, you know, advisors and everybody with transparency. And that's just, I feel would be more wise. Allah Oh, Okay, we are over time, but this question uh -huh. is, this question I believe is important because this is an aspect that many, many think about and it's something that I believe is critical to think about and consider and we would love your advice. What is better for the children to live with the toxic fighting parents or to peacefully separate? Yeah, so this is this sort of, you know, black or white scenario to me, I have a problem with because I don't think it's that simplistic. I think if we're, you know, dealing with people who recognize that they are in a toxic marriage, then we have to, you know, really uh, be heavy handed with those individuals, right? And this is where community responsibility and kind of like bringing the community together, the families, I mean, their involvement is important for that reason to say, it's not acceptable that these are the two options that you either split and cause maybe uh, certain problems for your children down the line because of a divorce. And then obviously the families are falling apart or you just maintain status quo and continue your, your toxicity. Why are those the only two options? Why isn't there a third option that says, stop your insanity, work on yourself, get some help, figure things out, but it's not fair because you made your bed, right? Or you, you know, as they say, you, you, what is it? You've made your bed and you, you have to lie in it. But basically you, when you make a commitment to marry, you have to follow through. You can't be this self-absorbed person that forgets that this is an amana, a contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you know, to be in this bond with this person. They have rights over you. You have rights over them. Your children have rights over you. So it's not acceptable, I think, to just say, well, you can maintain the toxicity or you can split. No. How about you do right by this child who didn't ask for their parents to be toxic? How about you fear God? How about you wake up from your ghafla and your narcissism or whatever else is going on and you remember that there will be a day where you will stand before God? And I think if our families are a little bit more also, you know, willing to hold people's feet to the fire and not just, you know, play this whole, um, you know, I'll cover for you and I'll enable you and I'll just, because you're mine, you're my, you know, you're my son, you're my daughter, I'm just going to accept you with all of your faults. This is also not a good, we, we, this is not our dean. Our dean, you know, calls wrong out, even against ourselves, we're supposed to be people that, uh, you know, that will uh, speak the truth. So if it's your family member who's abusive, who's toxic, who's causing a lot of problems, please hold them accountable and don't let them get away with obliterating and destroying a family just because they're too nefsy to work on their problems. But put it out there that, no, it's expected of you, um, especially if you want our support that you do your due diligence to try to work on yourself. We'll help you, we'll support you. But this attitude of like, oh, we'll just take you, you know, with all of your problems and allow you to continue to, um, you know, harm people uh, and, and, and force them to stay married to you or, uh, you know, destroy a whole family unit. It's just, it's not, I, I just don't think those options are, are right. We have to do better. For your time, for your insight, for your du'as, and for your love for our community and the community that you are serving in your area, um, please come to the East Coast, please. Um, if we could end with a simple du'a for everyone who is joining, um, for everyone who will be joining after, so that they may self-reflect, inshallah, so that we all may self-reflect, inshallah. Sure, inshallah. Um... Ya Allah, we ask you for strength. Ya Allah, we ask you for guidance. Ya Allah, we ask you for protection against our own selves 
for protection in our families, in our homes, for our children. We ask you for spouses that are God-fearing, that fear you, spouses that are aware that they will be held accountable for their actions. And we ask that we become spouses that fear you and that we are aware that we will be accountable for our actions. And we ask you for muwadda in our marriages, for love and rahma and compassion, understanding, respect. We ask you for tongues that do not try to uh, to to harm and and uh, and and call, inflict wounds on on others, but rather tongues that uh, practice restraint. Uh, we ask you for patience. We ask you for guidance. We ask you for sohba that are remind remind us to be the best versions of ourselves, not people that just inflate our egos and uh, and give us uh, this feeling of of entitlement and superiority, but rather remind us of accountability and that we uh, we must do our best um, and, and persevere despite the challenges. We ask you for family members who are not meddlesome, who do not intervene in our uh, or intrude in our marriages and uh, pry in our marriages and get involved, but respectfully maintain the boundaries. And we ask you for teachers to guide us, to help us so that before we even marry, we are aware of our rights and we uh, we are uh, entering marriages fully aware that we have more rights to be considered with uh, more uh, responsibility to be, to, responsibilities to be considered um, to be um, worried about than rights to uh, be entitled to. And we ask you for uh, your continued forgiveness for our shortcomings and our wrong actions and uh, that you increase us in faith and you increase us in patience, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and you put us in the footsteps of the best of creation, your beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and help us to acquire beautiful character so that we become exemplars for one another and for our children and our future generation. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah protect all of you and your families and your marriages. And for those who are in difficult marriages, may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala um, either provide for you an outlet to remove yourself from harm or provide guidance for you and your spouse so that you can protect yourselves and shield yourselves from the attack of uh, your nafs and shaitan. I mean, you know, I mean. May you Thank have you. a blessed rest of the Friday because you have a few more hours of daylight on the West Coast and may you have a wonderful weekend, inshallah. Thank you again. And please forgive me for uh, just, I just want to say this for my own personal self, for anybody who was in that conversation and who felt that maybe certain things weren't touched upon, or I was maybe being very simplistic. That was not my intention. It's a very difficult topic to talk about. And I know there's a lot of individual cases that people may feel like, well, that's not you know, that doesn't apply or that's not this or that's not, this is a general topic. And the audience really was for those people who are being attacked by Iblis and their own nafs and encouraged to divorce prematurely. That's what this talk was for. If you're outside of that, please forgive anything that was said that didn't satisfy or suffice. Um, and just pray for our community. There's a lot of pain. Uh, I can't tell you how many uh, messages I get daily, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that about people who are really suffering in their marriages, and I see it as a spiritual war. We are in the midst of a spiritual war, and Iblis is severely attacking our community. So the the talk was was to really bolster people so that before they make any decision that could have devastating consequences, that they remember not to allow their nafs to be the one dictating, but rather to hold themselves accountable to God first and foremost. And if children are involved, to also remember that uh, they are innocent and uh, sometimes our uh, negligence or our own you know, self-absorption uh, may cause harm and to be mindful before we make decisions. That's all I was trying to convey. So if anybody has any further questions or, or anything, you can always contact me verse, via my social media, and I'm happy to try to um, address those things maybe in future talks. But I, I uh, thank you again, Noor and, and the Celebrate Mercy team. May Allah bless all of you. Jazakum al khairin. And forgive me for going on for so long. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.